delighted now to be joined in the studio now by someone who has been appearing on our TV screens for well over a decade. Featuring and starring in shows such as London's Burning, The Bill, Spooks, and also nominated for a BAFTA as well. But more recently, you, you may have seen her uh, in um, The Night Manager, but also on BBC Three in 13. Now, as you know, I hardly ever watch TV, but I've been watching both of those. So I'm particularly excited about meeting Natasha Little. Good afternoon. Hello. <laughs> it's a true story, Natasha. I don't really watch much TV. I'm more of a book reader and I'm constantly yeah. going away on my laptop. But Sunday evenings is when I'm like, OK, I'll have a bit of TV to chill out. And I've been absolutely hooked on The Night Manager. Oh, it's a gripping story, isn't it? It really is. But I'm going to wait to ask you about that stuff because uh, more importantly, we do want to speak about the work you're doing with World Vision at the moment. Now, I know um, that you went and met some MPs at, in Parliament yesterday, but we, let's go back before then. When did you first get involved with World Vision? What attracted you to working with them? And tell us about your, your trip last uh, year. Um, well, last summer, I uh, did a voiceover for a child trafficking campaign that World Vision were doing, and I became interested in um, what they do. And then in December last year, I was invited to um, go and see their work with refugees. Um, and so I was really keen to find out more. So I went to Serbia, um, where they had uh, set up I, it's difficult to describe actually because to describe it as a sort of a refugee centre sounds really grand. What, the place that I visited was a, a dilapidated motel at the side of a motorway next door to a motorway petrol station and this place was now being used um, by World Vision to um, uh, give refugees a break when they travelled from the, the south of the country on buses um, to the north of the country before they went on on trains to into Croatia and I was I I knew I'd sort of read up and seen pictures of um, the work that they were doing there before I went but um, I have to say it was pretty overwhelming so um, you've never seen anything like that up and close before then no and I think um, you know we've all seen the images of um, those terrible journeys that the refugees have made crossing the sea from Turkey uh, to Greece and you know we have you, you know you can get a, a, a little bit of an idea of what their their circumstances are like but actually meeting those families seeing the the um, the fear and the the trauma on those children's faces it's um, it really brings it home in a way that um, you, you know you you, you can't imagine what their lives have been like and um, the refugees that I spoke to you know they, they you know their lives um, are like ours you know their their hopes and their fears are the same as ours you know they so many of them spoke about education for their children um, you know one woman broke down in tears not when she was describing the awfulness of her journey but when she described to me how well her son was doing at school in Syria um, you know I met a family who um, had walked across Hungary to reach Serbia with their two sons aged 10 and 11 um, and they don't didn't even know where they were going you, you know they're just fleeing um, the bombs the slaughter the killing these are the words that that they were using about why they'd left their home and you know their their heart's desire is to to return back there I guess when you see things like that it can be it can be so overwhelming that we can sometimes think what can I do yeah. to make a difference but I know you, you've as a response to that you've teamed up with World Vision what was it about you was it that trip that made you think I need to do more about this I want to get more involved was it literally seeing it for yourself that prompted you to want to to do more well I think it, it, you're right it's really easy to feel hopeless when you, you see the enormity of the problem and um you know, charities like World Vision are, are, you know, working really hard to help the symptoms of the crisis. And when I was there, it was clear that the work, you know, they're experts in their field, the, the staff that I met, and um, their their work they work with such integrity and compassion and sensitivity in the midst of all this trauma. And they were um, offering not just practical help, but um, you know. Uh, 
uh, they were giving out, they're distributing food. There was a, a child friendly space there where um, mothers can rest and breastfeed and get clean clothes, nappies. Um, uh, you know, so th- so World Vision are doing an amazing uh, an amazing job, not just in Serbia, but they that they have um, refugee help that they're offering in um, Lebanon, in Jordan, and in Iraq. They have massive operations in 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 those countries. Um, but yeah, World Vision and uh, are also calling for um, the government to look ahead and to to you know to start looking at how. You, you know what's going to happen in the future you know these are uh, um you know this problem is very immediate now and you know it, it takes a lot of money to to um finance these resources but at the same time we also need to be looking ahead at you know what what's going to happen when these people can finally return to syria um and before that happens you know what can we what can we do to help these children who have you know have nothing um and there's lots of children that that need that help and i guess they're some of the most vulnerable really at that age as well obviously everybody needs help but to see children uh, in that position and with their whole futures hopefully ahead of them but so uncertain that's where something needs to be done where we we need to step in it and do something and i know a, a step towards that was your your meeting with ministers yesterday uh, tell us a bit about that the aim of it and what happened there um yesterday world vision had an event in the houses of parliament and it was an opportunity for world vision supporters to meet with their mps um, and discuss what the MPs are doing, discuss what the government has been doing and to look ahead. And um, there's been great news this week. The House of Lords have um, agreed to amend an immigration bill. So that means that um, 3,000 child refugees will be can be brought from Europe into the UK where they'll be safe at the moment um, for unaccompanied child refugees they are so vulnerable you know that these are children who have traveled from syria or afghanistan alone and i mean when i was in in serbia last year um we took some bubbles out you know just blow bubbles to just to sort of you, you know um play with with the children and um i was standing with a group of children and um one little boy just caught my attention I don't know why and I said to him oh is that your sister because he was sort of playing with a little girl next to him and uh he said no I said where's your mum and dad and his his parents were in Afghanistan and he had traveled alone um now I have uh, an 11 year old he goes to senior school in September so I'm getting used to letting him walk to the end of our road on his own I cannot imagine having a young child and what it must be like that yeah. these people are desperate that they get their children out of the country or children who have lost their families and they're traveling alone they're so vulnerable to all sorts of um all sorts of problems so it's great news that it's it's still yet to be debated in the Commons, and um, hopefully the government will make that a priority. That that the immigration bill, um, the amendment that allows three thousand unaccompanied children to come into the UK, hopefully that will be you know that will be a reality really soon. And my guest today is Natasha Little, who you will have seen in probably uh, just about everything, uh, everything very policey, um, <laughs> lots of things um, that I actually have, to have. As I said, I don't watch much TV, but most of the things that were listed, I must have seen you a million times, Natasha. Uh, <laughs> but tell us how you first started into acting. Did you always want to be an actress? Uh, I think it was something that I always enjoyed, but um, my parents weren't actors and I didn't know any actors 
as I was growing up so I think I sort of thought it was something that other people did you know I think I had this thing that you perhaps you had to be a child of an actor to be able to do it you know but I always I always enjoyed it. So obviously at some point that that hasn't been the case because you've had a long and successful career in it what was your first major break would you say what was your your first big role? Um I think the uh, probably what changed things most for me was um, a show, gosh, it's a long time ago, I'm showing my age here, <laughs> called um, This Life, um, which was in the 90s about a group of lawyers. And um, it was... Uh, it was filmed in a sort of at the time that was quite a new way it had new writers new directors and the cast at the time weren't established actors and um you know some of them gone on to to, you know to become quite well known Jack Davenport Andy Lincoln um Daniela Nardini you know so there was it it sort of had a it, it kind of caught um the public's imagination at the time I think I mean, you've worked with some incredible people and just like I mentioned in, in The Night Manager at the moment, I mean, what a cast in there, people mm. like Hugh Laurie and um, obviously have to mention Tom Hiddleston. Apparently lots of the girls in the office are fans. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Olivia Coleman as well, who's one of my favourite actresses as well. Yeah. What an amazing cast to work with. Yeah. When um, you give, you're give you given scripts and roles to play, what kind of factors do you consider when you decide whether to take a role or not? What Do you, do you choose? I know it can be a bit feasible or famine with any creative industry but do you have a kind of criteria you look for yeah I think um I mean with this one it was a it was a bit of a no-brainer the the stories by John le Carré so you you know it's a great uh thriller um you've just mentioned some of the cast and um you know so it um that was a draw and the director Suzanne Beer you know won an Oscar so it, it was and um you know, we were filming in Spain and Morocco, <laughs> so uh, and I, I, the character was really interesting as well. I think, um, I, it's um, when I read a script, it's it, you, it, it's got to be there's got to be something about the character that you, um, either love or are fascinated by that you, you know you want to want to spend some time with that that character. I mean, it's been hugely successful. And I think every Sunday night it's trending on Twitter uh, <laughs> as well. And uh, I hear, is, is there, there talk of it going stateside? Is that right? Um, well, I know, I, I I don't know if it's confirmed. I hope I'm not speaking out of turn <laughs> here. But um, that I think John le Carre has agreed that those characters will go on to do another another two stories. I'm not, I don't know what that will look like. Um, but uh, uh, he, John le Carre was very pleased with the production and um yeah so it's quite exciting that from an original um novel it, it's sort of developing into a you know a life of its of its own rather than being a, you know having a novel adapted Absolutely. into a, a screenplay so it's great that he's thrilled with it and um you know anyone who watched I think it's episode four he makes a little cameo in the, the <laughs> restaurant where there's a an argument about lobster salad <laughs> And speaking of unusual and interesting stories, you're also into 13 at the moment on BBC Three, which as well I've I've caught a part of, but I need to catch up, so don't spoil it for me, Natasha. Okay. I'm sure you won't anyway. Um, but just in case anyone hasn't watched it, just give us a brief overview of the story. Cause it, it's so compelling, terrifying, but absolutely mm. draws you in as well. Yeah. Um, in 13, I play the mother of um, a girl who was kidnapped when she was 13 years old and she escapes 13 years later so returns home when she's 26 and um the it, it's um it's a great story it's it works as a thriller the the kidnapper is still at large but it's also um it also looks at how she adapts to um life after captivity when people have moved on life has changed um so it's a it's a I think it's a really brilliantly written piece actually and Jodie Comer who plays the Ivy Moxham the the woman who was kidnapped is um it's worth watching just for her she's she gives an incredible performance <laughs> 
It's interesting with a story like that because often with anything that happens in the media, even going back to what we were talking about with the refugee crisis, mm. there can be so much media attention around events. For example, um, you know, that has happened before that um, where people have escaped from mm-hmm. being kidnapped and then suddenly it disappears. Everyone yeah. kind of moves on and gets bored and you think, well, that's a person. What's going on? Yeah. You know, the other side of the, the refugee crisis, what's going to go on with these people's yeah. lives and where they have to do that? What role do you think we should be playing as... Um, well, what role should the media play? But also as Christians, what should our response be to, to these things in terms of making sure, you know, the other one I was thinking about the other day was um, the girls who been, went missing yeah. all, all those years ago. Yeah. Um, and just, you know, there was the hashtag and everything, but it has kind of just gone quiet, but yeah. they're still missing. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. And for the refugees that I met, you know, I'm, I'm back home now in my comfortable house. And I think, where are they now you know I remember I met a couple who um from from Syria who had been bombed three times and three times they moved to different districts and when I um met Rodin she was pregnant and I don't know which country her baby was born in um you know lots of the the refugees were heading perhaps to Germany other countries that they mentioned some didn't even know where they were they were going they just wanted to go to a place of safety um but even when they they reached even if they did know where they were going they you know that's not the end of the end of their journey um you know their their lives have been turned upside down in a in a way that I can only begin to imagine I mean and that there's there's babies that have been born on that journey mm. mothers who've given birth and are now nursing newborn babies and they're stranded in Greece Macedonia uh, other countries um they don't even know what what's going to happen next you know that that i mean that, that's something that world vision is doing simply trying to pass on information which can be a really precious thing when you don't you you know when you don't even know where you're allowed to be and it's um you know I mean when when I was in Serbia um World Vision um told one of the members of staff there told me of a, a a little boy who was three years old and he'd become separated from his parents when they'd crossed the border into Croatia he was so distressed he was vomiting I mean can you imagine you know what it's like if you lose sight of your child yeah. for you, you know a moment in a supermarket or something to be to have crossed a border thankfully World Vision were able to work um, with the Red Cross in Croatia and that family were reunited wow. but in the in the chaos in the panic of um, borders closing desperate parents think that a child is with the other parent uh, and vice versa uh, and children get left behind um, so these journeys are you know horrendous they don't know where they're going they, you, you know, and it's not like they've come from a, a place of security. They've left their home because it, it, it's it's been at war for for five years. But do you? I mean, you haven't had to do this. Uh, you've got the platform you have as as a, an actress and a successful actress. Um, have you felt a, a responsibility to want to use your your platform in that way? Does that come from your own personal faith? Or just from you as a person, I mean, it's an amazing thing to be able to use your platform so people are more likely to hopefully listen. Um, but do you feel that that responsibility to do that? Um, well, I I feel the fact that I was I sort of was um, doing a voiceover for Child Vision. It felt like a divine appointment, actually, and you know to have the opportunity to speak to to MPs and. Um, you know, when when you see need in front of you, um, and we all saw the pic, we've all seen the pictures, you know, of that little baby boy, that toddler on the, the his body on the beach in Turkey. You know, you don't need to see the 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 real people, but when there's need in front of you, you know, we're called to respond to that, and this is. A humanitarian crisis like we've never seen in in our lifetimes um you know we've got to act you know we'll be 
we, you know, we need to respond. It's not, um, it's not enough to just um, feel sad and then forget. You, you know, these are people, and um, you know, and we we need to we need to respond. Um, it's heartbreaking when when you when you see children and mothers in front of you in desperate need and they have nothing you know I saw children in Serbia it was minus three in flip-flops or with wet clothes you know and thankfully at that point in their journey World Vision were able to provide um, dry clothes and shoes and socks and food um, but the need it, the need is great and so our response to that has to be great too you know and we can do something you know and I remember one of the refugees that I met he said European people are kind British people are kind and I I thought you know I think British people are kind and people want to give people want to help and how blessed we are that that's not our lives Mm. because in you know it so easily could be you know and in the Houses of Parliament yesterday I thought gosh we're very blessed to be in this country you know it's not without its issues but we live in a democracy our voices can be heard our MPs are listening to us um you know we're we're very blessed and I know that there are problems in this country but you know when I those refugees that I met that's that's on a scale that um it's um it's beyond beyond my circumstances here beyond what I can imagine having to endure well I think it's fantastic Natasha that you are using your your platform as as you are and I know many of us will want to make a difference as well so thank you so much for coming on the show this afternoon and talking to us about it and I will eagerly be watching the final edition of the the night manager on Sunday Um, if anybody does want to find out more and, and help in a practical way or in any kind of way where could we point them towards um world vision have a website that's worldvision.org.uk refugee crisis so you can find out more and how you can help um, those, some of those people that I've been to, talking about For more interviews, music and debate, listen to Premier Drive with me, Loretta Andrews Monday to Thursday from 3pm on Premier Christian Radio where faith comes to life